Yo, Christian masculinists. Today, we're going to be talking about suffering. And this is the ultimate shit test for masculinity. And we've been talking about it a lot between and amongst ourselves, Mike, Will, Nick, and me, Tim. And I just wanted to jump right into it by throwing it to the panel. Guys, Buddhism, or if you watch movies, what we call Judeo-Buddhism, says that you should avoid suffering with every corpuscle of your body, with every cell you have. Avoid suffering, do whatever you have to to avoid suffering. There's a famous Thomas Jefferson quote that says, the art of life is avoiding suffering. And everyone seems to instinctually agree with this. And yet, we embrace the one worldview slash religion, Christianity, that says, nay, suffering is good. And with the proper kind of suffering, we're, we're going to talk about what redemptive suffering is, we can, usually we can actually unite ourselves to Jesus on the cross more profoundly. So um, I'll throw, throw it to Nick right away. What, what are we to do with this instinctual uh, non-match? Because, yeah, we're, we're supposed to do other things that run against our instincts as well, like hating our enemies. That's very natural. And pretty much every other worldview says, go ahead and hate your enemies. I don't have as much of a problem with that one conceptually as embracing your cross, uh, picking up your cross, and going and dying on it, which is, in, in um, Michael O'Brien's expression, the only two points of life. Pick up your cross, follow Jesus, go die on it at, at uh, Calgary. So how are we supposed to deal with the fact that we're the outliers in yet another realm of Christian teaching, and this one is definitely harder than even hating your enemies? Or, or, or is it harder than hating your enemies? Guess it depends on how bad the enemies are, and if the enemies are the ones who are making you suffer, or they're just people who are hurting your pride. But the suffering thing, um, I mean, I, I I'm speaking about this as somebody who's learning. I feel like 100 percent of the wisdom about it live and actively. So I'm not I'm not speaking about this as a sage whatsoever. Um, anything that I'm saying is like a few a few days, weeks, or hours old of my understanding. Um, but it seems to be that suffering is what we're called to do with it um, is another way that we're different from the animals that we don't really spend a lot of time considering. It's easier to grasp the idea with grappling with something like lust and chastity that, okay, it's like we're not supposed to be like the animals. The red pill guys are pretty banal um, and carnally driven if they're just trying to procreate without responsibility. But animals flee from suffering. There's, you don't have animals who sacrifice. You don't have animals who um, lay down their lives for another or engage in like prolonged water fasts because they're trying to reach some sort of higher spiritual state. Like that's what humans do because we can understand something beyond the, the carnal needs. Um, but I don't know that I've realized until recently just how deep the animalistic programming goes and how instinctual it is for me as a modern man to just flee from it at all, or to like treat the suffering as data that something is meaningfully wrong, not just carnally wrong. Like how that hurts doesn't necessarily mean that there's something like metaphysically that needs to be rectified. Um, and humans can understand that animals can't understand that. So I guess I'm becoming less, less and less of an animal, the more that I suffer. Of course. What do you say, Mike? I think if you look at, um, the world we live in as a whole right now, um, the spoils of comfort and, you know, the Uber eats mentality around everything and pornography and the indulgence of the flesh, you're seeing a culture that's experiencing this avoidance of suffering and the fruits of that avoidance of suffering. And even when you, you think about it, even outside of, let's say outside of a Christian worldview, <clears throat> going to the gym, building a business, being a good husband and a father, um, necessitates a certain level of suffering. 
right? You go to the gym to build your body, build your strength. You're you're suffering, will, willfully suffering through those sets and reps to kind of get to that next level. No different than, than a business. We've all got experience with that. But then now you look at the unique example of Christ, where it was like this willful walking into suffering. Um, and uh, for obviously for um, our salvation, the perfect, the perfect example. And so and you look at the most mentally healthy people, like Will said so beautifully a little over a month ago with the Saints, what do they all have in common? Well, they suffered greatly. Um, and it's it's hard for me to properly, you know, articulate, you know, why I think it's so important. But in my mind, the question comes, okay, well, what's the alternative? And I think the important question we were talking about this episode is redemptive suffering versus vain suffering. I think getting into that and, and parsing that out and the distinction between those two things is very important. Um, but my question is, it's like, well, what's the alternative to suffering then? Is it just a, a life of comfort where we live? Like, I mean, I don't know if you guys have seen that movie Wally, where it's like these people are hooked up to computers all the time. They're they're being like literally, you know, fed all day long. Is that the movie the is about people in Wisconsin, USA, by the way? <laughs> it's a documentary about Wisconsin. <laughs> That's, that, that's good we just yeah, lost I mean, three like, subscribers yeah oh yeah all, <laughs> yeah all three and a half of them but uh yeah it's, it's like well what, what's the alternative you know we're seeing in all uh, a society that's avoiding that's avoiding any kind of conflict or suffering and in in that it's so interesting how in the avoidance of suffering you tend to just suffer more at your own hand yeah. what do you guys yeah. think about that i think that's right and i i want it i mean it so in the avoidance, I want to get to this eventually, but we, we don't have it laid out yet. In the avoidance of redemptive suffering, one causes vain suffering. That's literally the relation. And it and all of a sudden, you're maybe sinning and you're, your suffering is doing nothing for no one. And you're not united to Christ on the cross. And um, Lord knows I've done a fair share of this in my life. And we're, we're going to get to that. But, but Will, what do you think about just the fact that in yet another way... We Christians are outlier to really the animals and all the other humans. The other humans have worldviews which are are consistent with the animal instinct to avoid suffering. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? There's no religion or philosophy that stood the test of time that said that happiness is the main point of life. Mm -hmm. So there's plenty like Buddhism, Stoicism, for example, that do try to... Um, acknowledge that suffering is a feature of life, like it's an unavoidable feature of it. But for Christianity, the point is that suffering is in some sense like built into the fabric of it and has a point to it. Not something we have to avoid, but we have to actually let it shape us. And there's a really interesting book on this by Father Remler, Francis J. Remler, called Why Must I Suffer? A Book of Light and Consolation. And if anybody wants to go deeper into this topic, I highly recommend having a look at that. He gives about 15 reasons. And the big ones right at the top link it back to original sin largely. And it's about the metaphysics of man, like the whole view of reality that Christianity gives. And he just says, look, one reason you're going to suffer is it stems from original sin. God gave Adam and Eve gifts that were above human nature. Uh, those were lost due to disobedience. That's the fall. And pretty much all world religions and mythologies have some inkling of the fall in them. They don't articulate it fully, but it's there. But people have got some intuitive knowledge of that. Because of the fall, we're going to suffer. Adam and Eve didn't deserve those gifts that were above those nature, their nature. We definitely don't. Um, so we've got bodies. That means we're going to suffer bodily. We have minds. That means we're going to suffer in our minds as well. And not just individuals, but whole societies can have this happen to them. And that's what you find when you look back through history. And when Mike was talking there about how luxury is damaging, I was thinking of that great survey of the rise and fall of societies by Sir John Glubb. And he talked about how, like, without fail, decadence and luxury precedes decay. When you're not suffering, when you've got everything you want, when life is great, when the economy is booming, then that's when the rot sets in. And about a generation afterwards, your whole civilization crumbles. So it's like we need it. Suffering is good for us. 
Can yeah, I jump in on that? Yeah. No, sorry. Go ahead, Tim. Go ahead. No, I was going to move on. So you, 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 oh, you do it. Okay. <clears throat> um, the Christianity being the only worldview that proposes this, it's, it's sort of a one, two punch. It's not just the worldview that says that suffering is going to be part of this and that it's okay, but it's also, you're going to suffer. You have to be okay with it. And if you're really doing the Christianity thing right, you should do it with joy. And that's the part that kind of freaks me out the most is the last part, because I think, I don't know if this is analogous to um, the stages of continents, you know, the virtue mm -hmm. continents, but like I can suffer and sort of grit my teeth and be okay with it and not be bitter that I'm suffering because I recognize that it's just and okay. But then the suffering with joy thing is the part that like, I just, I can't even wrap my brain around yet. And it's just another one of those ways where yeah. Christianity is the heaviest thing. It's the biggest thing. It's the thing that calls man. And I wish this was something even two years ago when I was on Tim's channel pre-reversion and we were kind of discussing the faith. And I was like, well, I don't know. It seems pretty effeminate. There's not a whole lot of fight here. There's not a whole lot of masculinity going on with, with this whole Catholic thing. Couldn't be further from the truth. Like the, the bigness of spirit and the courage that it takes to not only suffer, but then to suffer well and joyfully, that's superhero stuff right there. Right. And look, speaking as a guy who, was deep into Nietzsche at one point, as I've said multiple times, the idea of the eternal recurrence of the same, seeing that life is tough and just basically sticking two fingers up to it and saying, bring it on again and again and again. That was something that appealed to me. I didn't quite know why, but it's about the embrace of suffering and how it can forge you. And Christianity actually articulates that properly. And I don't know, Nick, I'm not sure you're supposed to figure out how to do it. This is something where we need grace to be able to do it properly you have to be yeah. a, a saint really to be able to suffer through life with joy but mm. with resignation i think you can do that just by your own natural powers you can resign yourself to it and that is virtuous right but to do it with actual joy and smile at it be grateful for it you need grace to do that and mm. that's exactly what christ provides like christianity is supposed to elevate the natural man and if we didn't have to do this we could just blow smoke up our own asses the whole time. I think we're great. We've become very mm. prideful. And I think that's why luxury is a bad thing often and suffering is good because it humbles us. We yeah, we, that, the bad right. people are going to be saying um, the, the ancient Greek tragic worldview of amor fati. Amor fati is the only other contender with Christianity, the, the tragic Greek worldview for um, loving your fate, you know, Oedipus, can only see once he's blinded and you know all, all of the stories of the remaining greek tragedians but it's not redemptive so there there is a kind of spartan greek pre pre socratic greek spirit that says endure it and enduring it is the truth but it's not it there's nothing redemptive in it so I, I i just stipulate that at the outset so people are saying it's the only worldview that says we're redeemed by our suffering and that enables us to go higher in i don't even know if it's joy but higher in our complete resignation to it and knowing that that it unites us to something higher but the, the i mean it's interesting how people mediocre intellects when they want to get religion they get buddhism we've talked about this a lot on cmask but i mean the the basic uh syllogism embraced by Buddhism and all the other world philosophies aside from maybe the tragic Greek one is um, suffering comes from desire, wanting, wanting stuff, wanting what's ostensibly good. Desire causes suffering. Cease all desire. This is, Nietzsche had a term for this. It's passive nihilism. Passive nihilism, the worst thing you can do. Cease all your appetites, like cut them off, even the natural ones. Catholicism, in, you know, we don't have to talk that much about this because I do want to go deep on redemptive versus vain suffering. That's the main point for today. But 
I do want to show that if you try to stop suffering, you do, Buddhism gets that one thing right, that the suffering comes from wanting um, life. Want, you know, like, remember William Wallace says, like, uh, I don't want to be a martyr. You know, like, no one wants to be a martyr. He's saying, I want life, but I'm willing to overcome it. That's very Catholic. Uh, Braveheart's a very Catholic film. So, so what I'm saying is, if you buy into the kind of Judeo pop Buddhism that is every other world philosophy, you actually have to buy into something, and no one really does, but you have to start buying into denying things that you want, like life. If you're a married man, your wife and your kids, you know, long, long healthy life. You have to like pretend you don't want those things. Catholicism is such a challenge. Because it says, no, 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 these are these are well ordered things. You're not you're not allowed to want pornography or or you know illicit drugs or something like that. That's not even those aren't even natural desires or to be homo sapi homo sapienism. That's not even a natural. Um, that, that's that's an unnatural desire. But things like long life to to want to be with your wife and your kids, these are natural desires. And Catholicism says, go ahead and go ahead and want them. These are well-ordered desires, but don't paganize them by obsessing over them. Don't um, turn them into idols. So, yeah, I just wanted you guys to maybe comment on that. We're, we're, we're outlier in that way, too, that we even acknowledge. It's, it's good to keep desiring stuff. Keep, go on with it. Just when you don't get the object of your desire, be willing to say, okay, this is what God's plan is for me. Tim, in, in um, uh, Aeschylus has King Agamemnon make the point you just made about suffering there. He That's right. says, uh, in our sleep, pain which cannot forget falls drop by drop upon the heart until in our own despair against our will comes wisdom through the awful grace of God. And a few lines later, justice inclines her scales so that wisdom comes at the price of suffering. Now, we know that what Aeschylus means by God isn't the same thing as what Christianity means by God, but he's making a similar point to what you were just saying, right? Justice comes at the price. Suffering comes at the price of... Wisdom comes at the price of suffering. That's what you're talking about. Yeah. It's in the first book, the first of the three books of the Oristia. I remember yeah. remember him saying this. Yeah. Plus, he's dead in the other two, so... Spoiler. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. And, and I mean, it's some, and there's, there's overlap between the tragic Greek worldview and the Christian worldview. Mike. When I think about suffering, I think about, uh, I mean, it's fitting because this is Friday. I think about the first sorrowful mystery, right? The suffering in the garden where, yep. you know, Jesus is pressed upon the ground. And even he says, you know, if this is your will, you know, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but yours be done. And there's something, I mean, he's trying tears of blood at that point and it's very easy to, to to say this much harder to do it but when these things happen that because quite often you know we make requests to god these things that we want don't come true in our timing they don't come to fruition in our timing and i think you know when i think about my battle with let's say hypochondria or anxiety or whatever i'm not sure where this has come from i think this is you know obviously my reversion has helped but understanding god's will is at play and it's way greater than anything I could imagine. And looking back at my life at how much joy I've robbed myself of suffering in vain over these things that most of the time were eventually added to me, just not in that particular timing. We don't understand that we're not in as much control as we think that we are. And, but there's a, there's this, this comfort in the suffering, knowing that it's in the hands of the father. And again, very easy to say, but for me, that's something that's so immensely com uh, comforting where if like Jesus suffered in the garden, he asked if this cup could be passed from him, but it's not my will, but yours. And so I remember this moment when I walked in to, to, to the doctor's office, I was getting some stuff done on my abdomen because there was a little lump or whatever. And I had just sort of like resigned to the fact that I can have no control over this outcome. And I tried to like, you know, uh, brainwash myself into thinking it's not brainwashing that either way it's a win-win the win is i get to live with my family another day 
The other win is I could potentially inherit my glorified body. That's a hard conclusion to come to, but I don't know. For me, there's immense comfort in that. And every time I've made it to the other end of suffering with that in mind, as hard as it is, I always come out better, more faithful, more graceful. Yeah. It's tough to contextualize that though, Mike, because you're the protagonist in the story and you don't know how it ends. And so it it takes like an act of faith to do what you did and to become resigned. Um, the story that's oldest in the Bible isn't Genesis, it's Job, which is just a story of a good yeah. man, a good man suffering ostensibly without cause or purpose beyond that God felt like testing him and basically engaging in uh, a wager with Satan. Satan says, like, I, I bet you I can convince him to come and basically be bitter at you. And God says, no, I think I think I know his heart. I think that through all the suffering, he's still going to be faithful to me no matter what, even if I take his crops and his land and his wife and his kids, give it all back to him and then take it all away from him again. <laughs> I still think he's going to be faithful to me. And it's like bizarre that that's the oldest story because it's also not even a narrative that kind of has like this. It's not like Lord of the Rings where you do have the resurrection at the end of it. It's somewhat of a, seemingly senseless story and it reminds me tim and i were just talking about the binding of isaac as well which is um the only point from that that i'm going to relate to this is that it wasn't unjust for god to ask of abraham for his son for the life of his son it wasn't unjust it's not killing it's not killing in the same way that you and i would kill another man and take his life it's not ours to take but all life is god's to take and it's not unjust for God to mete out suffering either, which is something that I would never have been able to wrap my mind around as an atheist. Like, oh, what about the children at St. Jude who have cancer and they're on the TV? Or what about the ASPCA commercials of like these poor puppies that are being abused? Like if God existed, he wouldn't allow this. It's just like such a, a myopic perspective on Suffering and a misunderstanding of what God is. But it's funny because because we're in the midst of it and we can't see the end of the story, we're like bamboozled every time. At least I am. I don't know about anybody else. But I'm like shocked every time that there's suffering. I'm like, what? There's suffering in this story? Like, what does this mean? Why? <laughs> so uh, it, it's... Twofold, like obviously this side of the fall, it's our fault. So that's all it's all justified per se. There's nothing, there's no suffering that could come upon us that would be unjustified. But also it doesn't even have to be justified because if God wills it, he would never will evil. And it would bring us more in communion with him. And it's just I think it requires an act of courage because as the protagonist of your own life you don't know the context of the narrative and so you have to submit to like the, the screenwriter basically say like yeah. I, tr I trust that you're a good storyteller right which comes back to hope and there's there's suffering not just because of original sin but because of actual sin as well and we shouldn't be surprised that there's suffering in our own lives and all around us for those two reasons alone original sin actual sin because we're all going to suffer the consequences of our actual sins, whether in this life or in the next. Purgatory, hopefully not hell. But you have to pay the price of each of your individual sins as well. Because God is perfectly just. Perfect justice means there's always that debt to pay. And it gets extremely high. Like Even for an average guy that you wouldn't think of as a really bad person, the debt by the end of a lifetime gets extremely high because that's just the reality of fallen human nature. So it's healthiest, I think, just to accept all suffering that comes your way as at least what you um, like deserve. That's that's just the best way to look at it. You know, so, we were fundamentally this, undeserving of grace too. So right. you have to understand that w with that is going to come this hard walk, but there's this promise, right? The three, um, the three points, faith, hope, and charity. Right. We know um, there's this there's this promise of eternal life. But I mean, 
like with anything else, there's there's a price to pay and we're undeserving of it. Uh, God doesn't gain anything, zero things from us, but we gain all things from him. It's it's the cross that we have to bear. That's it's part, the best part way of it. To put, that's the best way to put what I was trying to say is that what you just said, that God doesn't gain anything from us. We gain everything from him. And we even gain from the suffering that he's giving us. It's not a subtraction. <laughs> It's not a subtraction. Yeah. And it's 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 a very confused way of looking at it to think that like suffering is a subtraction from a good that we own, like that God then took from us. It's like very, very confused, disordered way of looking at it. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's it, it's it's um it's also a mercy for us because it it's better to suffer in this life than it is to suffer in purgatory. Tim, I I'm pretty sure that the um there's a tradition in the church that the the purgatory um, hurts like just as much as hell does. Like the, the fires are the same. It's just that you've got the hope of being able to get out. So if you when you suffer in this life now, be grateful for that because it means you can actually get to work on your weaknesses now and you better do it rather than in purgatory. Yeah, some of the mystics have spoken of it that way i i hope they're wrong there's no yeah me too no teaching on anything <laughs> other than there will be a purging i really i hope it's more just like you're just you're just chilling um in in a waiting room but even waiting rooms can be <laughs> pure suffering as, as me and mike know in catholicism <laughs> we have this concept called redemptive suffering i'm reading from corpus christi catholic church it had a really good paragraph on this some churches actually teach there they lay people. That's amazing. In Catholicism, we have a concept called redemptive suffering. What this means is that in actively and willfully joining our sufferings to the cross, we cooperate with Jesus in our own and others' redemption, effectively making us co-redeemers. Now, the, the, the Protestants don't like the idea of co-anything, co-redemptrix or co-redeemers or cooperating in grace. They think that that disrupts God's sovereignty, but I think that's the best definition I found online. It's just some little church is, is actually teaching its people. And um, there's a, a line in the Bible that, that is the foil now. This is from Galatians chapter 3, verse 4. Have you experienced so much in vain, if it really was in vain, or a better translation is, have you experienced so much for nothing? Surely it was not in vain, was it? So this is St. Paul telling us there is such a thing as vain suffering, vainglorious suffering. And it is what happens when we attempt to avoid suffering that, that God has given us, A, or B, we come up with through actual sin or through actual vice, we fabricate suffering for ourselves that God did not have for us. So the difference is really stark here, and it takes a lifetime to really tell the difference between redemptive suffering and and vain suffering as it's happening to you. Redemptive suffering is where we say, okay, God had this in my path. I didn't choose this. I'm not suffering because I started doing heroin. That, that would be vain suffering no matter what. I'm not suffering because um, I'm, I'm avoiding something, some obstacle that God put in my path. It's redemptive and we can literally cut out our own or others purgatory time if we just say okay this is this is what god has for me i trust him i i don't think it has to be joyful but it has to be fully submitted fully trusting and um you say okay i'm gonna i'm if you can think in real time this is good i'm uniting this suffering to jesus on the cross the nails in his hands and feet then that's redemptive suffering if you avoid those opportunities I don't think this gets said often enough. It becomes vain suffering, and it it it's probably some kind of idolatry. Uh, what do you think about that, Will? Yeah, I think that's true. It reminds me of an essay I wrote a couple of years ago on Fight Club and how it takes some of the ideals of Christianity but extracts them from the spiritual framework that you just talked about there. So men do hard things, right? You get out of your comfort zone. You want to suffer, destroy something beautiful, just smash people up, make them bleed. Let's all get together in a mosh pit and hurt each other and suffer. But what's the point of that? It ends up being nihilistic and vain suffering because it isn't united to any overall spiritual purpose. You're not actually joining yourself with Christ on the cross, like Tim said. So unless there's 
an embracing of it, but also allowing yourself to be touched by grace and purified so it's elevated. It just turns into a way of saying that you can save yourself somehow if you put yourself through enough hard experiences, which is prideful and stupid. There's a yeah, you're building up. Uh, sorry, go ahead, Nick. <clears throat> There's a left bound to it where it could turn into sloth, though, and that's I think the the discernment question that I'm still trying to figure out, which is there are people who they suffer because they're lazy and they're also very just woe is me like oh all these problems in my life is just because i guess you know life sucks and i'm not going to do anything about it so what i'm still trying to figure out is as as somebody who's perhaps over proactive with trying to pursue solutions um where's the golden mean of that where you can identify this is not a problem that i am supposed to solve this is a problem that I am supposed to be redeemed by. Hmm. You're going to say, Mike, you, you had something. Man, that's a great question. I was, I was going to say something completely separate from that. Oh, man. Um, well, you don't want to pray for a hole while sitting on a shovel. Right. So that's people sitting on, you know, just my prayers. I'm not going to out, go out and be and be proactive. In my experience with all of these things, I think God makes it pretty obvious. But I think how God makes it obvious is by you trying to pursue solutions and continuously falling flat. Okay. That's a fair point. And that, I mean, I, that that's as far as I can take it as like an, an idea exploration out loud, because that's been my experience is when these things have happened outside of me. If I keep running into walls or obstacles or things, I'm like, okay, well, I think God just needs me to sit back here and sit in it. And to the point of, of joy, I don't think all suffering is supposed to be joyful, but I think it's what St. Paul talks about in Philippians. It's a peace that transcends all understanding. It's peace. Yeah. Yeah, And so in my experience, when things go well, man, when God opens a door, things flow like a river, like effortlessly, seamlessly, it, 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 it's, 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 it's beyond words. Like I can look back at so many instances in my life where I'm like, everything is just working. It's God has his hand in it. But when I am trying to force God's hand, which I know that I can't, I often run into walls in business and, you know, my family life or whatever external circumstance is happening to me, it becomes abundantly clear. Um, Cause I just, I not speak to it. Maybe God speaks to us in different ways, but to me, it eventually becomes abundantly obvious where I'm like, okay, I just got to sit back and allow this thing to happen and trust that God will guide me through. And there will be a break breakthrough of wisdom at the other end of this, which again comes back down to what a leap of faith, right? Yeah. It's terrifying. Yeah. Everything, yeah, everything the, you just said I mean, is very in uncomfortable. The, <laughs> in the Catholic tradition, we are proud of the proposition that fides et ratio go together. Mm -hmm. They've gone together forever. We always have told Protestants that faith and reason are not contraposed. They work in the same direction. And, and well, I, I'm usually telling Protestants, fides is not a kind of... Um, um, episteme, right? It's more like pistis, if we're going through the Greek word. Faith, faith is not a kind of really knowing. It's an act of the will that goes along with what you're able to know about truth in your intellect. But the suffering question makes faith and reason seem to be contraposed for the first time, even for a Catholic. Mm -hmm. You're like, well, my reason tells me I should do everything to wriggle out of the I'm pinned under the car that causes suffering. I had to try to get away. So there, it makes sense that it would present some, at least this intellectual crisis. I want to talk about the masculinity crisis in closing, but it creates this intellectual crisis where all of a sudden Catholics start feeling like Protestants where we're like, wait, I thought faith and reason go together. Well, my, how can I make my reason say to embrace the suffering? There is a way. It's that, you know, these lines in the Bible that we're all citing and the fact that um, Jesus said, hey, no servant is greater than his master. 
I, the world hated me first and I suffered for it. The world's going to hate you and you're going to suffer for it. So that is in, an intellectual basis for believing in the acceptance of suffering. But at times we start feeling like it's an intellectual crisis. Do you know what I mean? We should try to get, we should try to get out of this. We should try to be comfortable. Like if I have a headache, I'm going to take an ibuprofen, right? Well, I think a lot of, a lot of people out there watching CMask might be like, well, where's the difference? And this is kind of what Nick asked too. Like, what is it wrong to take an ibuprofen when you have a headache? Yeah. But sometimes if you get a really bad migraine, you take an ibuprofen or a lot of them and the, the headache doesn't go away. That's when redemptive suffering kicks in. I think that's the solution to Nick's question. Yeah, or well, more serious illnesses as well. Terminal ones that might drag on for years and years that you're stuck in. You just have to accept that there are lessons to be learned from them. Offer up the suffering as penance for your own sins, the sins of others. Unite them to the sufferings of Christ on the cross. And then there's uh, use to be found in even the most terrifying illnesses. Yeah. Yeah, crucified. Or else crucified, I mean... Guys, crucified Jesus is the symbol of Christianity. Anyone who's ever had the the callow thought that Christianity is effeminate, just because most Christians nowadays are effeminate, they, look at the symbol. I mean, look at the other symbols for the other faith, like a crescent sun or whatever, um, s star of Rainon or whatever it's called. Star of Renfam. A cross-legged Renf fat guy under a tree. Yeah, like a, <laughs> a fat ass, a, a, a fat Asian guy, you know, that just had too much fried rice or something. And then and, and there are other ones too. I don't know all the symbols, but then the God man crucified with sanctifying blood pouring out of wounds. I'm looking at a big crucifix that I have in here dying. And usually most crucifixes are, you know, sort of snapshots of 3 p.m. when he's actually hanging his head dying. That's amazing. And, and it's based and it's it's manly. You know, and that goes to what we speak of most weeks. But for this week, how do we forget that Christianity tells us to embrace our suffering? How do we forget it? Look at our cross, look at the symbol. It's ridiculous. You well, are I just I guess maybe a slight bit of vulnerability here because we've been discussing like hypochondria and, and whatnot, but it was only very recently in one of our conversations, Tim, that I realized that um, while I don't fear diseases, I still idolize health in the same way by studying and pursuing well-being as if it were an idol itself. Um, understanding the body such that I can effectuate a state of well-being at all times and pursue it at all times um and only through these conversations am i realizing that it's uh it's a refusal to accept reality which is that this will decompose probably painfully and earlier than i hope and i'll lose this and everybody around me will experience some version of the same thing um and struggling against that in, in youth, I guess, is a little less delusional, you know, because you're, you're a young person and it's fine, but <clears throat> it's still idolatry, but it's also still, I guess, arrogance and pride that like to think that I could overcome it. And it's the same, it's two sides of the same coin of like fear of the disease itself will like you can't run from it from that side either. Like it's going to get you either way. Um, and I bring this up because I still, I'm wondering, I'm literally in the moment now, I'm considering if this reflex towards solving problems is similar to the Gnostic reflex of trying to get more knowledge, that knowledge itself is inherently good. It's like, well, it's a good but having more knowledge is not necessarily inherently good. This is what caused the fall. And this is what like the Masons and the Gnostics are wrong about, which is that more knowledge is not always gooder and more health, more productivity, more solutions to the suffering. I'm 
literally right now only considering the possibility that maybe that's not the case, but I'm so like neurotically fixated on this idea of like, well, I, I need to improve. I need to improve the life circumstances. I need to improve the health of my body. I need to improve all of these as aspects of my life. I don't know if that's like, because my dad said like, work hard at everything you do. And I was like, yes, sir. I will work hard at everything I do for the rest of my life. Or I don't know where it comes from, but I, starting to think it might be like anti-christic or, or anti-christian not anti-christic anti-christian well taking reasonable care of your body with water food sleep reasonable care of your mind as well with study is a way of honoring god and everyone else who depends on you and also providing for the common good of society so we got to do it right but the point is that we can't idolize it and when we get sent afflictions, things that remind us that ultimately everything is fleeting, including the things we hold dearest, that's actually a way in which we're reminded of something very spiritually important. So it's good for us to know that everything ultimately that we love and cherish around us in this life is when it boils down to it, in some sense, vain and fleeting. And if we didn't have suffering, if we didn't have affliction sent our way we wouldn't be reminded of that. We wouldn't right. get that reminder of ashes to ashes, dust to dust, which turns our hearts towards the only really lasting thing, which is God himself. Quick point on the uh, hypochondria piece too. And because I've certainly struggled with um, going down the rabbit hole of symptoms, addressing symptoms and trying to get answers and trying to get answers and trying to get answers. And looking back, it's really what I lacked was the virtue of, of temperance and trust in God ultimately, because I tried to think of, think it out to its end, its logical end. And I'm like, okay, well, if I don't believe this doctor and this test and this specialist, like what is this going to require of me? Uh, uh, a full body CT scan. And then I'm going to go as far as saying that I don't trust that technician at that particular lab. And I would go get another one. Like I'm now just, I'm indulging in like a, a, a this, this, this flesh want that drives me away right. from the trust of God. That's what, that's what it comes down to. That's for me or making things an idol, right? Like where I feel like my self-esteem is built up in how much weight I'm able to lift on a given day, instead of just saying, being grateful to God, giving all glory to God. Hey, I'm able to show up and do this today. Grateful for the bad sessions, grateful for the good sessions or how much money I'm making or not making. But the one with the, the hypochondria really, really hits hard because past a certain point, man, like that level of anxiety, um, you're only driving yourself further into chaos, into insanity, uh, because there's never going to be an answer that's sufficient besides that yeah. worst case scenario diagnosis, because there's no way that anybody can tell you with 100% certainty that you're okay. And what's that 0.5% of assurance that we get? It's It's the faith and the trust. That's a hard thing yeah. for me to swallow because I go in and out of it all the time. And I know Nick and Tim, you guys can relate. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's sort of the essence of it. And I guess the essence of the question isn't the intellectual tension it brings about because I showed how faith and reason still strive in the same direction, um, even on the suffering question. Catholics are just right. Protestants are just wrong. Uh, like, sorry, faith, faith and reason do go together. They're not two different ways of knowing. You know with your reason and you act with faith uh, toward love. The object of reason is uh, the truth, and the object of faith, like the object of the will, is the good. So they, they have to go together, or else the whole anthropology, the whole um, metaphysics breaks apart of Christianity, not just of Catholicism. But there remains a tension, and this is where, what I want to close with, with masculinity and suffering. Our culture is, as Will's always pointing out the, the, with some glub quotes, it's a culture that is decadent, meaning decadence is the, one of those words that tells you a lot if you look at the etymology. It means both decay and like grandeur. It's the decay of grandeur. So when we live in a decadent culture, we live in basically Nick and I, the why American Republic, Republic, why why Marica. It's it doesn't get more decadent than this, and and Canada and England are are basically the same. So even the goodly Christian guys, even the guys who are Christian influencers, Nick, Will, Mike, Tim, 
are guys that need this reminder, like more often than guys who are lay leaders of the faith or something like that uh, 200 years ago. Because back then in America, there are frontiers people. They went to the frontier knowing they might get scalped. They might get like diphtheria. They didn't have all kinds of ready-made medicines for a headache even. Even something as simple as a little infection could kill you. So they they did not kid themselves that they, um, the, in the midst of life, were among death. That line from scripture. Didn't kid themselves about that. We kid ourselves. And so this Heideggerian moment where you have to confront, I will die. Sooner or later, like Lord Denethor says, he, well, he says better soon than late because he's lost all hope. But sooner or later, I will die. That's like news to us. Even smart capable, brave men who lead. And I'm just saying that does present a crisis for masculinity and it can't not until we get ourselves over the hump with, with the embracing of suffering. That, that's, that's my last word. What, what do you say, Nick? The, the red pill is just such a useful foil for so many things and suffering and masculinity and success. It, it just fails so perfectly on it that it holds up Christianity very well. If we're talking about masculinity, I think the thing we should be using as a metric for God's assessment of you as a man is the degree to which you are being mortified, humiliated, how much you're struggling and how much you're suffering. And then the metric that the man ought to use for his masculinity in response to that is the degree to which he is peaceful and joyful within that. I can't think of something more dissimilar to what cultural masculinity is sold as today. I think if you take masculinity and you rip Christ away from it, all you really have is like, uh, masculine nature like machismo like a set of behaviors you know you get a guy that's incarcerated for killing a bunch of people yeah he's a manly guy but it's absent of virtue you know i think when you try to separate virtue from masculinity you just have barbaric nature and so when you marry that those things together virtue and masculinity you have this perfect example in christ and you fundamentally realize i have a crucifix here in my gym and i look and it just reminds me every day that it's like it's not about me it's not about my glory. It's not about what makes me feel good. And that if we know as Catholics, if we know as Christians, that this ultimate example is in Jesus and he suffered greatly, then who are we to say that we shouldn't? You either suffer for something great or you suffer in vain. And I think a lot of times we don't really have like a a choice. Let's say you're addicted, you're suffering in vain, but you know, you're kind of at the mercy of this addiction, but you can make a choice to um, not be fat and not eat as much to lift some weights and get yourself in good shape to uh, deny yourself, you know, looking at the woman down the street or watching pornography. Uh, that's forms of redemptive suffering. And it comes back down to, I, there really isn't, and this sounds cheesy, there really isn't a masculine, there is really isn't masculinity absent of Christ. It's just this machismo nature um, that, eventually fades away in old age when you become um, old and weak and fragile because at that point you've just built up this like flesh like you know f fight club endurance and eventually that withers away and uh, what are you left with if it's just nature what are you left with You're not left with much yeah even the old penny catechism for little kids used to teach them that the point of being alive isn't to be happy it's to love and serve god and be happy with him in the next life kids used to be told that and that's one of the most profound truths you can get as a human being happy in the next life 
but love and service in this life so that what you're really doing is enduring life but in some sense desiring death like that's like the base psychological level for a christian you endure life but you desire death and the chance of happiness in heaven and then once you start with that you can see why it was a a spiritual practice for people to just begin each day reminding themselves that they're going to die live that day like it's your last day you know the old-fashioned writers used to have skulls or hourglasses on their tables like don't forget death's coming and you better not waste time doing good because death is not going to be behind his time and the other thing with the anxiety about when might i die providence has a plan for that and with good reason for your spiritual benefit and even for the spiritual benefit of your relations as well like you accept death when god sends it because for some reason you might not understand it's good for you in that moment and good for your family too to me that's a really like high level way to think about it i can't fully grasp it but the idea that it might be good for a man's family that he dies in war for example like all the crusaders who went left their families behind dysentery whatever it was they died of it was good for some reason that their families lost them right then and god knew that because earth isn't the end game it might not make sense to us right now but from the eternal perspective it was good that dad was lost at that moment yeah yeah even uh back to the future doc brown knows it's not good for any man to understand his future. That's an utterly secular movie, but no man knows the hour of the return of Jesus or of their own demise. And this, this is, it's got obvious spiritual benefits. We, you're supposed to suffer in the right ways and not suffer in vain ways. So hopefully this has helped this, this little episode on what it really means to be manly. I think Mike said it best for this one. There is no masculinity without Christ. It's just some pantomime. It, it looks a lot like Achilles on the hunt. I mean, Achilles is a badass image. You know, you slang, dragging Hector's body after the death of Patroclus or, or something like that. Or in a, in a more LARPy way, the red pill, beanies, you know, per performance <laughs> enhancing drugs, you know, Jeez. long gray hair, whatever, whatever. But it's, it's not, it's, we have to say it that starkly, that without Jesus on the cross, embracing his cross, without actually pantomiming that, we can't be manly. And um, our work is cut out for us, boys. Well said. God bless you guys. Hallelujah, man. You as yeah. well, bro. This is great. Uh, yeah, I hope I hope this episode has been helpful for everyone. You know, you get a, get a skull on your desk as you work. It, it can be a replica. You don't have to like start robbing. Graves. I think you, so. Real quick before we close, I was just in my hometown last week, and you know, my daughters are getting baptized at the end of the month, and we, my my nona, their great grandmother, got them their little baptismal outfits, and while we were there, uh, I bought like six or seven or eight crucifixes. So, uh, you guys want a reminder more than skulls or an hourglass? Put a crucifix in every room that you have, that there's a visible Christ in every single room of your home. I'm not joking. I have one in my gym in every room in the house at this point outside. Um, we need that reminder constantly. I have my rosary beside me. And it, this sounds cheesy, but it, it it's effective. Nothing yeah. grounds you more than looking at that, that, that snapshot of 3 p.m. when Christ's head is down and his spirit leaves his body and the prophecy was fulfilled. Glory to Jesus Christ, man. Yeah, because it's not just death. It's resurrection as well. And right. without the cross, even if you do attain some measure of virtue, so what? Your your ashes with nothing afterwards. That's right. That's right. There's vault.